One year ago, I sat down on this bed with my sister to watch the final episode of Disney's The Owl House. We don't have cable, but luckily enough, the next day after it posted, April 9th, Disney posted it for free on YouTube, saving me the hassle and needing to connect to a VPN, and it was a great time. We prepared bingo cards, talking about our theories, and we were competing. I don't remember who won, but it was a night to remember. In fact, we watched all of season three that day. I dressed up as Philip for the final episode. I remember we had snacks. It was a blast. This is the final episode in my season three, The Owl House retrospective series. And like the episode in question itself, this video is the end of an era. I have made 29 videos directly about the Owl House and another seven where it is a big topic. I watched The Owl House for the first time last February, and I gotta say, the show has completely changed my life. I know it sounds cliche, but it's true. Like I've said, I've made 36 videos related to The Owl House, which is a crazy number, and it hailed in the animated TV show era of fictional fanatics. Since last March, I've been focusing on animated and animated-inspired content and shows, stuff like that. I've been covering it. I've seen so many new shows which have slowly become some of my favorite things of all time. But even more than that, it inspired my love for making animation. I distinctly remember, in between watching season two, I went on a run, I think the last episode that I actually watched was through the Looking Glass Ruins, but that's not really important. The takeaway from the run is that I wanted to tell my own animated stories. I was just thinking about the show's brilliance at the start of the run, but at some point I started thinking about ideas which I could use for my own animated show. I've had plenty of previous desires to tell stories, which will one day be the subject of its own video. Plenty of formats, plenty of ideas, but this idea, the one related to the Owl House, was different to me. So on that one and a half hour run, I began to imagine the premise for a show which still lives on inside of my head. I still have some of my old rough and bad concept art, and in my pocket notebook, I constantly am still writing down new ideas for this show idea, which doesn't exist, but it has such an impact on me that I love to keep developing it, so one day I might be able to tell it. Um, I started looking into some free animation software and television too. Plus, I was lucky enough that my parents still had a way content, which they used to teach during COVID. And soon enough, I would get the opportunity to make a video. The two biggest aspects of my life, my love of animation and my pursuit of short film, is directly correlated with my love of the outhouse. But at the same time, things are changing. The short video essays about cartoons just isn't going to be the norm on this channel anymore. And the simple short films, too, are soon going to be a thing of the past, with my growing experience and ambition for these projects. So, on the anniversary of the end of the most influential show of my life, let's do this one last time. One last video in the retrospective series, one last video essay akin to the past, a last trip into the Boiling Isles. Watching Dreaming is a curious episode of television. My opinions have been constantly fluctuating as I pick up on new details on each viewing, and my most recent watch through has completely changed my opinion of the episode, but my rating is still somewhat the same. The episode has my, some of my favorite moments in the show, but also many moments which don't leave me completely satisfied. Either way, the episode is very special and had a big impact on me. Out of all the episodes in Season 3 of The Owl House, Watching and Dreaming is by far the most mixed in my eyes. Thank to them is unequivocally perfect, For the Future is heavily followed, but has good ideas, and I'm just not sure what to think about this finale. There are so many layers to my opinion. To truly understand it, we need to go deeper than before. I don't mean nitpicking every moment, but getting to the bottom of why I love the Owl House and seeing if this episode fits the criteria. 
To do this, I need to take a trick back. If only I had some videos or something. Okay, I'm not dumb enough to watch 36 videos, especially when so many are so long. So I'll just be looking at my most important ones, reviews and recommendations, and some of the more emotional <laughs> are my takeaways. The Owl House is an innovative show with so much to love. At its best, there are many things going on at once, and it's incredibly thought-provoking and character-driven. It focuses on both family, friends, and lovers' relationships, and all those different themes are incredibly balanced. It's unlike anything else on TV and should feel incredibly special. That was really cool taking a trip back down on memory lane, rewatching all of those videos. But let's stop procrastinating and instead, let's finally begin. The beginning of this episode is the part which I'm most conflicted about. We have some phenomenal concepts, odd choices, and bad execution. The tone feels so half-hearted for what they're trying to achieve, and I'm confused because there's a much better execution which feels so much more obvious. The episode begins with the three main protagonists being faced with their worst nightmare so that King will play with the Collector due to Bellows' manipulation. A some concept which seemed really cool at first, but is really- <laughs> I am Minka, and I say that it, that it is a great show! Simple concept which seemed really cool at first, but is really lackluster for me now. <laughs> the biggest problem is, this isn't real. Luz's friends don't hate her, and Luz doesn't need to face the trauma. She escapes the situation because the elector mistakes a quote from a book. And that just isn't satisfying. It is not. Worse, this isn't the biggest fear of each character, it's what the Collector thinks will make them realize how wrong it is to abandon them. Really if wrong. this was another episode, it would be amazing. Plus, if we just got a bit more time to focus on it, I would be all for this idea, but it feels melodramatic for a finale. The Collector is just pulling the other characters into his shoes, showing what it feels like to be cast aside and villainized by other people you love. It's great for collector development, but it is only partially explained by one line, which I needed to go and rewatch to make this video and understand it. And that just feels weak. I don't know how it will be introduced, but I have said since the release of this episode, if we want these characters to face their nightmares, it shouldn't be puppets. It should be more conclusive and a more poetic force. Grom. If we remember back to Enchanting Grom Fright, Luz couldn't face her fear in season three. No, she she's couldn't. gonna <laughs> She's gonna be more insecure than ever. So why don't we tie up a loose end and bring in Grom to kick off the finale? The collector may understand how Luz is feeling about being an ass cast, but why he doesn't know all of her fears. Grom is a mind reader. He knows exactly what Luz fears and how to break her. So, if Luz could finally face her fears this time around, it would show her growth as a character and show why the Titan would choose her later on, making her return from the dead easier to understand, which is already a point I'm covering a lot later because... Wow. <sighs> Plus, since the character wouldn't be dreaming, our main characters can fight Grom together. I'm it's far out there, but maybe Grom was a failed experiment of Philip. Grom feels so unnatural to the Boiling Isles, barely passing as a creature, plus the fact that he reforms every year. So maybe Philip created him so he could have summoned Grom to the head as a distraction so he can go to the Titan. Either way, this would give all the characters something more proactive to do, and would be much more potent thematically, as well as being a great reference to a past episode and a fan favorite episode. The Collector's redemption. redemption is the most mixed part of the episode. On the one hand, the Collector breaking into tears makes me cry every time. It is one of the most heartbreaking parts of the episode. But on the other hand, this feels out of place. Having the Collector struggle to understand humanity, to relive moments of the past of the Owl House, is brilliant. But this is the finale. When I complain about the pacing of For the Future, this is why. If this wasn't that episode, that episode would be near perfect. 
But instead of continuing to talk, what could have been talking about how I would change things, let's take a look at this for what it is, because what happens really works. A few weeks before the finale, I made a video discussing my problems with the collector, but when it, when the time came to pick my top 10 characters of the show, I put the collector in number 7. Watching and dreaming saves the character of the collector, the majority of the heavy lifting done inside of these awkwardly placed 10 minutes, and that says a lot about the quality. The best part of these moments is how it serves both as a redemption for the collector, but also as a celebration of the past for Lou's king and Ida. They get to revisit their past memories, and that is something really beautiful. This does a great job of setting the stage for the Collector to finish his arc in the next part of the episode, but just a little bit of compassion makes such a difference for him, and it's a great job of showing his honest intentions in retrospect in the end of Season 2 and the previous episodes in Season 3. But once again, my problem is the lack of supporting characters in this moment, most of which never get an interaction with the Collector, which would help his redemption even more. But that's more of a general rule of criticism, which I'll cover a bit more later on. I'm not entirely sure what to say for this section of the video. There are so many great moments, but also some of my biggest gripes out of the whole episode. Let's start with the positives. The Collector trying to hug Bellows is such great writing. All that the Collector has ever done is been to follow the words of others blindly, never questioning them or trying to understand their true meaning. And so for him to try to hug Bellows because Luz turns so many friends and enemies into friends makes perfect sense for his character, plus it is a great catalyst for another great moment. Back in my Luz character analysis video, I discussed why I love Luz's sacrifice so much. It not only works great here, but it's a great parallel and a callback to a previous episode of the show. In Season 1, Agony of a Witch, Luz falls in the footsteps of her mentor based on their first lesson. The lesson was that you should try to help out those you love however you can. In the first lesson, they stole from the Emperor's Coven, and so that's what Luz would come to do in Agony of a Witch. But she messes up and gets her mentor into trouble. The same thing happens with Collector. He learns you need to try to be kind with people. He tries to be kind to Bellos, and Luz, the mentor, sacrifices herself for the student. Of course, in the original case, the season 1 finale was where the consequences came into play, called Young Blood, Old Souls. The title represented how Ida was forced to grow up for her student, and in watching and dreaming, Luz grows up for her student, becoming an old soul. So the sacrifice, just perfect. Just as good was the reactions from everyone. King and Ida losing control, Luz's friends just not understanding what's going on, and then also Camilla's there crying, and then the Collector finally understanding the fragility of human humanity, with all the lights in the sky, him losing grasp of the final one. Again, <laughs> perfect. But what isn't so perfect is what comes next. Luz meets the Titan, who blesses her with the rest of his life force, so that she can be resurrected. I mean, a whole video arguing about why Luz needed to die, and just how that could fit into the story. Well, I don't think Luz needed to die, we did need something more dramatic than what we had gotten. This whole revival sequence is the only point where the Owl House felt held back by being a Disney show. If we look at another brilliant show which deserved more time, Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated, and their finale, it was tragic without having the characters die. Well, characters did die, but it's odd, and it's handled amazingly. Through the power of friendship, Mystery Inc. De defeats the big bad of the show, but in doing it, they sacrifice their whole timeline. Everyone they know, they're different. They get thrown into a new world where none of the problems they faced ever happened, where their life was more peaceful and happier, but this isn't their home, and they feel lost. If we want the Titan to give his remaining life support to Luz, fine, but the impacts need to be world-shattering. Luz is the only one who needs to use glyphs. Even if the Titan didn't bring her back to life, Bellos would have still drained the power from the Titan, so either way, we wouldn't have glyphs. And, again, Luz is the only one who uses it, so it's not that big a loss. And Kane is bringing new glyphs in the world anyway, so really nothing is lost. The Owl House is a show about facing consequences for your actions, and this, arguably the biggest consequence in the whole show, has minimal repercussions. And there are so many consequences you could have, 
which would be world shattering while not as dark as Luz 9. Maybe Titan's blood doesn't work, so Luz and Camilla can't get home until Kane is older. Have the Collector take the Titan's place as the life force of the Isles. Have the Titan's core split into different islands, go all Pangea mode, leaving a literal scar on the world with everyone in shambles and making any chance of reorganization after Bellows even harder. Each of these isn't that dark, but the status quo is forever shifted, and the world that we loved isn't the same. And for the audience, that would feel just as devastating as losing a character, since one of the best parts of the show is how the world, the Titan, really shaped the story. But back to the episode itself. Either way, Luz is reborn, and she has the power of all the glyphs. We have some cute scenes, and very quickly, Titan Bellos is defeated, and the day is just about saved. But Philip is still alive. Philip's conclusion, being out of cards to pull, was very satisfying. Having him melt in the rain, paralleling the most famous witch in pop culture, the Wicked Witch of the West, and then melted away in spring water. This section, the final battle, the rebirth chapter, is nearly perfect besides the big problem hiding its head with Luz and her return to the land of the living. If we just had a better method to achieve all that, then this would have been one heck of an episode. The conclusion to this episode was quite simple, and it was really peaceful. Everyone rebuilds until we flash to a future where everything is finally fixed and the characters can have a break and party. The characters deserve this moment of peace before the end of the show, and for what it is, it works pretty well. The biggest problem is that it tries to shut the storybook and hides the fact that we never got to say goodbye to everyone. These final minutes, both before and during the credits, prefer to take a montage route, which means we get a seal on what happens, but we don't really get to conclude our time with our characters. Like, for example, Hootie doesn't speak. There are so many characters which just don't say anything in this episode. We may see them in the background, but we don't really get to say goodbye. Now, is this a bad thing? Not necessarily. With how big a success the Owl House is, fans and the crew of the show alike feel confident that this won't be our last hurrah on the Blaine Isles. Whether it's a college adventure, a new thread, a look into the past, which has better call Saul as flashes into the future, or even just some book of stories, nobody knows. But to shut the book means that everything else would be separate. If we conclude each of these character arcs and say goodbye, it means that we need we will need them to change if we want to tell a new story. But if we are just to turn the page away from a new adventure, of course their journeys won't be completed. So leaving things unfinished is hopeful for the future, but not a perfect conclusion, although what we get is a happy look at everyone's future, and there isn't much wrong with that. There's not much to critique with this. There are some beautiful scenes. It's just not that conclusive. Like, lose with the glyph fading away. One of my favorite scenes. Everyone reunited. It's amazing. Everyone flying through the aisles in the credits. Amazing. It's great. Out of context. I didn't plan on being this harsh towards the episode, but in between rewatching this episode and scripting, I watched two of my favorite TV finales of all time, which changed my perspective a little bit. These finales come from The Good Place and Invincible Season 2. Both of these do such a great job in their conclusion, although for Invincible, I'm also talking about Season 1, but I just saw it Season 2, so it's fresh in my mind, and there are heavily heavy similarities in the first and second season finale. Heavy spoilers for both shows. The Good Place fina final episode... It's all the characters die, literally, one by one. They realize they have finished their journey. They are complete people who finished their character, and they die. The episode wasn't necessary. The previous episode was a pretty heavy action episode, which concluded the story and could have easily been the final episode of the show. But instead, we got one final episode, which really concluded the show in a bittersweet way. The problem of all the show is fixed. The characters can just sit back and be happy until they choose to pass on, just like all things need to. Even Michael, the character who would live forever, would rather take the chance to live a full life knowing he would eventually die, instead of living on in monotony. I might one day make an ep a video about the show because I love it so much and this finale is probably the best ending to a show that I've ever seen and I'm probably going to rewatch the show soon just because it is. Wow. Now, with Invincible, it isn't the best season finale of all time, but both the formatting of both season finales are so special, 
and I absolutely love them. The first 20 minutes of both episodes are action-packed, a violent extravaganza in the show. Your jaw is on the floor for the first 20 minutes, and they are crazy to watch. But then the last 30 minutes of the episode are all dealing with the consequences, rebuilding and moving on from the craziness which happened before. These quiet scenes in the second half are just as emotional as the fights, if not more. It gives our characters a chance to react and see the devastation of the violence, gives them a chance to say goodbye to the to us, say goodbye to the world until it gets picked up next season. I bring both these examples up to a compare with the Alhouse finale. One thing that stood out to me on rewatch of all my previous videos is what I said about watching and dreaming in my ranking video. I said that the episode didn't need to be the best episode of the show, it just needed to conclude the story. I use that as praise for the episode and I stand by the point, but I'm not sure if it really works for what watching and dreaming is doing. The Owl House is a bold, innovative show, so to conclude a story, we need a finale that is like nothing that we have ever seen before. The Owl House suffers by being the end of the Disney TV Trinity, as it follows the same footsteps as the show which walked before it. And so, when you do things similarly for a third time, in a show which is supposed to feel so innovative, it feels disappointing. The episode isn't bad, it is still a joint watch filled with so many emotionally rich moments, but the finale doesn't feel like a once-in-a-generation event, like it should have. But, that is just the originality factor, and there's still so much to cover with this episode and how it concludes the show. I keep mentioning how we needed to involve more characters in this finale. The world is about to end. There are five people fighting Bellows. Luz, Ida, King, Rain, and the Collective. <laughs> you see? He tried to kill everyone with Day of Unity, and yet five people are here to fight. And I understand the story, everyone else is puppet. But still, like I said earlier, the Owl House does a great job of balancing friends, family, and lovers. But this final fight is family only. Everyone else is trapped somewhere else. Luz's friends and girlfriend are in the Titan's head, and the Collector is sidelined to go over there as well. If he's just chilling out watching Netflix or something during the final battle, she keeps getting sidelined again and again throughout the show, and she really needed to be in the final battle against Bello somehow, since the reason she ran away is because he was enslaving her kind. I gushed over the season 2 finale, as we all saw, the different magic users fighting, giving us great dynamic fight scenes, which were visually stunning and where you could see everyone's impact on the fight since everyone had a preferred type of magic. The final battle, which we've been building up to where everyone unites in a mass final fight, just isn't in here, and it's the biggest letdown out of the episode. Like, it is even a bigger nail in the coffin when For the Future sets up the Hexide faction who just sits the final battle out. Imagine. King leading the type the Titan Trappers into battle, Amity and Bosch are leading the Hexolios, Rain and Ida leaving the Cuts, and Luz flying around causing chaos all around Belos in her magic uh, outfit, only for the trio to reunite to go to the heart like they do inside of the actual show. All of this was set up, and I have to think the only reason we didn't get this is because the show was cancelled. And if that is so, I take back my video where I defend the cancellation uh, as a casualty a casualty as big as this potential final battle is too tragic, where I would give up thanks to them for this fight. My favorite episode! We never get these final moments of heroism for so many important characters, and it is a real shame. So while we get a conclusion for the inhabitants of the Owl House besides Hootie, everyone else's moment to shine is never received. I place no blame on the crew behind the show. But, looking back, the flaws of the episode are obvious. I don't hate the episode, it is still a blast, through and through. But it was sabotaged, its full potential was robbed, and the fact that we got an end product with so many amazing scenes is a miracle. I watched this episode five times in the week it released. Whether perfect conclusion or not, it ended the Owl House, the show which changed my life forever. Think about what we gained, and more importantly, what we can learn, what we can do now going forward. And you don't. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining me these past year. With all the Owl House stuff, all the animation stuff, I'm on a new journey and I am so excited. And I hope you keep joining me along the way because I'm really excited and this is going to be crazy. <laughs>